This is where Castle Street ends. It used to continue north and at some point turn into Springburn Road. Now it stops dead at this T-junction. The reason for that is they put a motorway through here, which completely disrupted the area. The motorway was part of the planned inner city ring road, which cut a wide path through the centre of the city. It affected this area worse than many because of the town head interchange, a collection of off-ramps, on-ramps, under and overpasses. This all but obliterated the area of Glasgow it's named after. One of the reasons for the interchange is the east side of the Ring Road was supposed to run south from it, more or less following the course of the High Street. This would have destroyed most of the oldest part of Glasgow, as the city, for most of its history, was pretty much the High Street and the area next to it. This is not the first time the area has been disrupted by a new transport system. In the 18th century, a canal was built here which would have made it harder to get to the fields to the north of the city. This was the Monklands Canal, which was built to bring coal to the city. By the 18th century, all the local sources of coal had been used up and it was having to be brought in. Roads at this time were muddy tracks which could have waist-deep potholes in them, and you could only use pack animals or small carts to move things about. Not ideal for moving large amounts of coal. Not surprisingly, a businessman had the idea of building a canal to move large amounts relatively quickly from the coal fields to Glasgow. The actual construction didn't go that well, with the original funds being used up before the work was finished, and even though a lot of canal had been opened, it was nearly abandoned a few times, and almost fell in a couple of times. Eventually it did get finished, and a basin constructed at Town Head, so they could offload the coal and transport it down into the city. The boats carrying the coal were not the long boats we associate with canals today, but barges which might have looked something like this one that's been left to rot at the side of the Forth and Clyde Canal. These photos of a similar boat being used as a pleasure craft will give you an idea of how it might have looked in use. Note, when these were full, they would sit very low in the water, with very little of the boat in sight. The canal was abandoned in the 1950s, and the motorway was built right on top of where it used to run. All that's left now is a bridge where the Monklands Canal met the spur off the Forth and Clyde Canal that came down to the north side of Glasgow, which, by coincidence, is right under the T-junction at the end of Castle Street. As you move down Castle Street, you can't help but notice a large spire on the end of a car park. This is what's left of the buildings of the Asylum for the Blind. If you were blind in the past, your life would be pretty tough. Unless you had a family that could look after you, or you were very lucky and found a way of making a living, a lot of the time the only options were begging or the poorhouse. The good citizens of Glasgow realised this and at the start of the 19th century founded an asylum for the blind, with the first building on Castle Street being built in 1828, which was paid for by public subscription. The asylum was used to educate blind people. It provided work creating the likes of nets, rope, mattresses and numerous other things. The asylum also provided food and lodging. The building was quite large and included a long rope walk where the rope making was carried out. The items that were made here were sold to help support the asylum. In 1828 they made £231, the equivalent of £25,306 in 2019 and by 1900 that had gone up to £29,000, £3,592,272 in 2019. The building you see now was completed in 1881 and was the winning competition entry by William Landless. The building is a really odd, gothic, Scottish, baronial mix of styles. The building was acquired by the Royal Infirmary, who used it for outpatients but eventually stopped using it. No longer being used meant it started to deteriorate, but fortunately it has been bought and turned into a boutique hotel and coffee shop, which saved it. In the 18th century, this would have been the northern edge of Glasgow, and beyond here would be fields, which is why you would have found a toll gate here. There was a post road to Edinburgh, and roads going to Falkirk and Stirling from here. The odd thing was there was another toll gate a couple of hundred metres up the road. The next big building you'll see is the Royal Infirmary. This started out as the building next to the cathedral, which was built on the site of the Bishop's Palace. The current building, though it looks similar to the original, is a replacement which opened in 1914. 
The original building was designed by Robert Adam and opened in 1794. The original plan was deemed too expensive and Adams asked to make it plainer to save money, which he did, saving about £1,500 in the process, which is about £224,862 in 2019. The dome on the top of the building housed the operating theatre, which was circular, as was traditional, with seating around it to allow students to watch the surgery take place. This is possibly the reason that such rooms were described as theatres. It kept on expanding northward and now makes up pretty much everything on that corner, all the way back to the next street. The additions have come and gone behind where the original building was, as the newer parts wore out or were no longer suitable and were replaced, while more were added. This hospital was also responsible for a couple of changes that are now standard practice round the world. The most famous was from Joseph Lister, who introduced the practice of washing hands and tools to surgery, and even going so far as to spray carbolic acid during surgery to keep things clean. Less famous is William McEwen, who introduced the wearing of sterile white coats. After Lister and McEwen's innovations, the hospital's death toll would have dropped dramatically. It's hard to believe, but this area of trees was once the junction of two busy streets. Castle Street and Glebe Street, with their tenements and a lively, bustling community. Next to the Royal Infirmary is the Cathedral, the oldest building in the city. As this is a video about Castle Street, we're not going to say much about it, as it would really need a full video to do it justice. We have done a short video about the outside, which is linked in the description below. If you look at the front of the cathedral now from Castle Street, it looks like a pretty standard sort of church cathedral type of building, but if you'd been here in the past, it would have looked very different. Through most of its history, it would have had two towers covering a lot of the front. These were removed in 1846 and 1848. It was discovered that there had never been glass in the window behind one of them. This shows that while the tower was an afterthought, as it covers the window, it was still built at more or less the same time as the rest of the cathedral, or the window would have had glass put in. The other difference you would have noticed if you'd been here in the past is you could hardly see the cathedral for a big wall and the outer wall of the bishop's castle. Behind the wall was a large fortified building that is often referred to as the bishop's palace, but would have actually been the keep. There was a space round it and at the wall which had a gatehouse at the southeast corner and a tower at the southwest, more or less where St Mungo's Museum is, making up the castle. All of that was built right in front of the cathedral, blocking the entrance from Castle Street. The castle was in a pretty bad state by the end of the 16th century. It was overhauled for the last time in the 17th century, but after that the castle was left to fall into ruin. It ended up being used as a quarry of pre-cut stone by the locals before the site was cleared at the end of the 18th century. Across the road from the cathedral is Proven's Lordship, the oldest house in Glasgow. It gets its name because at one time the Prebend of Barlanark lived there, with his title giving the house its name, but altering over time to Provend. This has been used for many things over the years, including a sweet shop, which made its own sweets and fizzy drinks, before being brought by a trust to protect and restore it. What's not so well known is that it was originally a part of a group of buildings, including a hospital and chapel. The other buildings have long since gone, and would have been where the barony church is now. The person living in Proven's Lordship was the chaplain who ran the chapel attached to the hospital. The hospital was actually an almshouse, rather than what we would think of as a hospital, and seems to have functioned as a sort of old folks' home. Rather confusingly, there were two almshouses. The fore arms house, run by the church, and the back arms house, run by the town. The fore arms house was home to twelve old men, and the back, four. It says a lot that the back house was falling to bits within a century and was demolished by 1600, but the fore house continued on until the 18th. There was also St Nicholas Garden, which was much bigger than the current one at the back of Province Lordship, which has the same name.
Next to Province Lordship is an imposing red sandstone building, the Barony Church. It's no longer a church, but is owned by Strathclyde University, who use it for degree ceremonies and whenever else they need a large hall. This is actually the second Barony Church, the first was across the road, where those buildings are now. The original church was quite a notable bit of architecture, but for the wrong reasons. I've seen it described as the ugliest building in Glasgow, and the ugliest church in Europe. This is a bit unfair, as it was a perfectly fine building, if a bit odd. The front looked like a Scottish baronial fake fantasy castle, and the rest was just a big barn of a building designed to do its job. I suspect the main reason for the harsh verdict on it is because it didn't look the way people thought a church should. Within a century of being built, it was getting into a bad state, so the congregation decided to build a new church across the road, on the site of a former gaswork, and that's the building we still have today. Across the road is a garden. In this garden, you'll see an equestrian statue. This is King William III, decked out as an ancient Roman. There is one odd story connected with the statue, and that is that the tail is supposed to move in the wind. But looking closely at it, this seems unlikely, as it is firmly attached to the statue. I would expect it would take a pretty stiff breeze to move such a big lump of metal. Going back across the road again, there was another piece of history which is no longer there. Just behind where the Barony Church stands, there was a gas yard. A quick explanation of what happened in a gas yard. From when gas started being used in homes until the 1960s, it was made in gas yards by cooking coal so that it gave off gas and other byproducts. The gas was stored in the yard in large gasometers. The yard filled up the space currently covered by the car park, as well as stretching from the roads at each end of this one and through the buildings opposite. You wouldn't know it had ever been here now. Townhead Gas Yard at first looks like it's been built in an odd location, right in the middle of streets and tenements of the area. However, when you learn that it was one of the first built in Britain in 1817, it becomes more obvious why they built it here. At this time, this was the very northern edge of the town, and still mostly a greenfield site. The other reason for being built here was that the Monklands Canal, and the plentiful supply of coal it provided, was just a short distance away.